Um, one of the things that's always a challenge after any thoracic surgery for any reason, but after mesothelioma surgery in particular, uh, is there is a group of patients that have um, either from the surgery, the radiation, and or the tumor itself, uh, some chronic discomfort in their chest or a real chronic pain. Fortunately, people that have real severe pain is usually a relatively small percentage of patients, but uh, it's a real problem. And, and uh, people normally can take care of these patients if you give narcotics and other simple drugs, but uh, they, they don't work too well in, in a subset of our patients. So we really need help. And uh, postoperatively, one of the things that we do is very helpful is doing epidural catheters, which relieves the pain very, very well for acute postoperative pain. But in the long term, we've had problems with controlling pain on, in some patients uh, over months to years. And uh, we've had relatively disappointing results when we send our patients to a lot of different uh, pain specialists around here. But uh, Irene Wu has, has uh, joined us at Santa Monica UCLA, and she's been, had a lot of experience in more advanced uh, and even invasive ways of controlling pain, including intrathecal drug delivery uh, methods and spinal cord stimulators. So I asked her to come and give a talk about these methods of pain control. So Dr. Wu. We're a little bit over back uh, over time, so we're going to stay just for a little longer, and we'll take some of the time out of the, out of the lunch time. Thank you, Dr. Cameron, for the excellent introduction. Unrelieved pain is one of the most feared symptoms in patients with cancer, and studies have shown that about 75% of patients with cancer, unfortunately, are experiencing um, pain that's difficult to control. As you know, and as, if you, as you've heard from uh, previous speakers, there have been a lot of recent oncological advances for treatment options. However, sometimes these also present with challenges that are difficult for us as physicians, especially with pain that's difficult to manage. Oftentimes with cancer pain, cancer pain can um, involve the nerves, it can involve the spine, it can also involve the brain, and in at least 20 to 40 percent of such cases, we are not able to adequately control the pain with just conservative analgesic ladder options. Intrathecal therapy has emerged as an excellent option for pain management um, because it adequately controls the pain, it improves patients' quality of life, it improves work rehabilitation, and it even decreases long-term health care costs. So in the short time that I have with you today, I hope to be able to discuss mechanisms of cancer pain, discuss mechanisms of intrathecal drug delivery, discuss indications for intrathecal therapy, as well as review the algorithm for treatment used in intrathecal therapy based on consensus guidelines, and then finally close with some potential complications that can be encountered in intrathecal therapy. There are many mechanisms that contribute to cancer pain. These can involve direct tissue in in invasion, inflammation, obstruction with the viscera, nerves, and the CSF, Cancer treatments such as surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy can also lead to long-term cancer pain. All of these mechanisms are um, contributing to nociceptive, neuropathic, and ischemic elements of cancer pain. Speaking of peripheral mechanisms of cancer pain, cancer pain has both peripheral and central mechanisms. With regards to peripheral mechanisms, the tumor can release nociceptive mediators such as protons, endothelin, bradykinin, TNF-alpha, nerve growth factor, and proteases including trypsin. All of these nociceptive mediators will then stimulate the primary sensory afferent nociceptive receptors and lead to peripheral sensitization and even central sensitization. Spinal and supraspinal mechanisms can contribute to central mechanisms of cancer pain. Studies have been shown that there are three primary mechanisms that are involved with central cancer pain. 
increases in descending facilitation from the rostral ventral medulla can release serotonin, otherwise known as 5-HT3, causing an increase in those levels. Right now, the only HT3 antagonist that we know of commonly on the market is ondansetron, which is otherwise known as Zofran, commonly used to treat nausea and vomiting. There has been no known clinical benefit in cancer therapy at this time with regards to serotonin, but it could be a potential target. Secondly, NMDA receptor activation in the spinal cord of cancer pain patients can result in long-term potentiation and central sensitization. The common NMDA antagonists are ketamine and dextromethorphan. Right now, um, as along with ondansetron, ketamine and dextromethorphan are not used in active cancer therapy, but ketamine oftentimes can be used to reset um, pain receptors in patients who have been on opioids for a long time. Patients that have had cancer for quite some time have sh uh, shown to have changes in their spinal cord such that they have an increased level of GFAP, otherwise known as glial fibrillary acidic protein. What this means is that uh, there will be an increase in astrocyte activation leading to an increase in release of inflammatory cytokines. Um, there have been some preliminary studies on the market uh, for anti I'm sorry, for glial inhibitors, um, such as anti-TNF-alpha, which might be a potential analgesic target for cancer pain in the future. Before I move on to more invasive therapies, um, I wanted to bring your attention to some recent um, advances in drug therapy uh, for cancer pain. Traditionally, it has been thought that the only way to manage cancer pain is through opioids. Um, over the last couple years, there have been actually new preparations of fentanyl. Um, we all know about the transdermal preparation. We all know about the IV preparation. And we also know about um, uh, the lollipop preparation. However, recently, there are new companies that are supplying buccal preparations, sublingual, and even intranasal preparations of fentanyl. This is helpful for patients that have undergone chemotherapy, and a lot of times they, they can't have anything in through their you know, GI system, and so having something that's easily um, absorbable um, with rapid onset is very nice for them. Um, especially with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, patients often present with neuropathic pain. Um, I like to bring your attention to the first-line neuropathic medications, namely Cymbalta, Gabapentin, and Lyrica. All of these are commonly used on the market for patients to help patients uh, with nerve pain. We've noticed that um, they often work better in in combination with each other. So um, we usually combine gabapentin plus Lyrica or Cymbalta plus Lyrica, or we even add a second line agent, which is typically a tricyclic antidepressant. A new me newer medication on the market, I think it's only been out for about two to three years, is a medication called Tependadol. It's, uh, the trade name is called Nucinta. Um, we usually refer to it as a stronger form of tramadol, but um, it actually has shown to have potency um, of an opioid. Um, it works via two mechanisms. It works via the noradrenaline as well as um, the pain receptors. Mu agonist is exactly the same pain receptor that opioids work by. Um, Typically, we like to use it for patients that haven't been tried on any opioids um, because of the potency that it has, and so um, patients seem to tolerate better tolerate better because it has um, fewer side effects um, than opioids have. Despite all these advances in oral therapy, um, oftentimes cancer pain is still very, very difficult to treat despite using neuropathic agents plus opioids plus non-opioid agents. Therefore, um, intrathecal drug therapy has been one of the most significant contributors to pain management for cancer patients. Um, one of the nicest things about it is that it um, is able to reduce um, side effects that oral opioids can cause. So what is intrathecal therapy? Intrathecal therapy consists of an implanted catheter, which is connected to an um, intrathecal implanted pump. 
So here's a schematic of the pump. I'll have more pictures in the next few slides, but here's the catheter. Basically, this apparatus allows um, for uh, prescri I'm sorry, for delivery of prescribed amounts of medication directly to the spinal cord. This targeted drug delivery um, allows the medications to reach the opioid receptors in the spinal cord almost immediately. Um, what does this mean? This means that um, these medications avoid a lot of the systemic distribution that oral opioids can have, and therefore many of the opioid-related side effects can be greatly reduced. Um, the only company right now that is on the market for intrathecal um, drug therapy is Medtronic. It, it, um, this is a picture of the programmer. So once the patient has the pump implanted, all we need to do if we need to adjust the rate or change the medication is to program everything externally via this pump, uh, b via this programmer. And uh, we can program in all different ways. Um, if a patient has more pain at night or if they have more pain while they're walking, we can um, program it so it, it delivers different amounts of medication at different times of the day. Um, the pump itself is usually implanted in the lower abdomen. It is connected to a catheter that is um, in the thoracolumbar region of the spinal fluid in the back. So a patient would have two incisions. Each incision would be about four centimeters or so. The pump one might be a little bit bigger just so that we can get it in. But the pump itself comes in 20 mLs or 40 mLs. Um, and uh, everything is tunneled underneath the skin. So um, I usually tell my patients if they're walking down the street, um, somebody else on the street would not know that they would have a they have a pump in, which is really nice. Um, there is a catheter access port here. This port is used um, for physicians um, so that we can check to make sure there's no leak, um, there's no obstruction in the catheter. All we usually do is inject some contrast, and under live x-ray, we can watch the contrast go through the rotors within the programmer, I'm sorry, within the pump, and then travel through the catheter. Um, this is the refill port. And uh, it comes with a template that we can just match to the patient. And in order to refill the medication, all we have to do is to aspirate the medication via this port using a small needle and then refilling it with the medication that we order. Um, typically, I would say once a patient has the pump implanted, they only have to come back to us for refills every four to five months. So it's really nice because they already have so many doctor visits as is. Um, they won't have to come back every month for medication refills. Um, right now, there are no positive uh, predictor, uh, factors, predictive factors with regards to success of intrathecal therapy, but I think one of the most important um, things to consider is careful patient selection when it um, comes to this type of therapy. First, you always want to make sure that a patient has tried conservative management. They've tried the oral opioid therapy and they failed it. Um, we want, usually patients have inability to tolerate the side effects of oral opioids and that might be one of the reasons why we proceed with intrathecal therapy. Usually we reserve this pump for patients that have had metastatic disease um, because obviously it's harder to control that type of pain. Um, Patient's life expectancy should be about three to six months or so. The reason I say that is because it, is, it does involve a surgery, and I don't know if patients with less than three months of life expectancy would really want to undergo a surgery to have this type of pump implanted. This is not to say we haven't done it before. Actually, I did three over the last month for, for life expectancies less than three months, just because they couldn't tolerate the CAD pump, which is medication through the IV. Um, if you decide to, um, if you decide to that a patient is good for intrathecal therapy, we usually put them through an intrathecal drug trial. Um, an intrathecal drug trial means that we would bring them into the hospital for about 24 hours or so just to test that they would tolerate the medication going through the spinal fluid um, without any side effects. 
Typically with cancer patients, insurance companies do not require psychological evaluation, but if you do this type of therapy for non-cancer patients, which doesn't apply to this audience, insurance companies do require psychological evaluation to make sure that there are no, um, there isn't an untreated depression or schizophrenia that could be hindering their use of the device. So how do we trial a patient for intrathecal therapy? Um, there are many, many different ways to trial a patient. Um, some physicians do it via the epidural space, which is the space right outside the spinal cord. Um, and most of us at UCLA do it through this intrathecal space, which means directly in the spinal fluid. Um, so what we do is we put a needle sort of doing like a spinal tap, um, and we access the spinal fluid typically at the L2, 3, or L1, 2 level, and we thread a catheter up to the um, mid-thoracic or lower thoracic region under live x-ray, and we tape, we take the needle out, and then we tape the catheter directly to the patient's back. Um, and then we observe the patient in the hospital for about 24 hours, during which time we would um, bolus um, probably every hour, every two hours as necessary, um, the, the medication and see how the patient tolerates it and how much it improves the, pa the patient's pain. Um, we usually say a successful intrathecal trial is greater than 50% improvement in their pain with minimal side effects. So here is a schematic of how we would start both the trial as well as the implant. So for the trial, here's the needle. We thread a piece of catheter. It's like an epidural catheter that we put here. Under live x-ray, we probably thread it to, usually in mesothelium patients, I'll put it up to about T7 or T8 so that it targets the rib cage quite well. Um, and uh, for the trial, again, we tape everything to the back. For the implant, we tunnel everything underneath um, the skin via a special tunneler and the pump itself is placed in, um, on the anterior side of the abdomen, either right above the belt line. The patient can usually choose if they prefer left side or right side, depending on what side they sleep on. So there are a lot of different medications that we can apply um, for intrathecal therapy. Most commonly, as you all know, opioids are, you know, um, what we run through the spinal infusion. The most common opioids are morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl. Um, however, it's become common practice to use combination medication, and so some of the combination medications that we use are local anesthetics such as bupivacaine, um, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists such as clonidine, and um, in, in mesothelioma, this is less um, common, but if they do have a component of spasticity, sometimes we can add baclofen, and then ziconotide, which is a non-opioid, works very well for nerve pain. Um, I'm going to go over each of these different classes of medications, um, and then we'll talk about the consensus algorithm. So, um, intrathecal opioids usually bind to the substantia gelatinosa, um, and it allows them to significantly affect pain anywhere inferior to the cranial nerves. With intrathecal opioids, you need a very, very low dose, um, and the concentration because it's such a concentrated um, environment in the spinal fluid. Um, a low dose would allow for very profound analgesia. Met these types of medications have a low coefficient of distribution in the lipids. They do not cross the blood-brain barrier, and therefore they result in very prolonged action. So even if you turn off the pump, a lot of patients will still have prolonged pain relief for at least a couple days before they feel um, either a worsening of their pain or any withdrawal effects. Um, to put it simply, we can classify intrathecal opioids via their pharmacokinetic and physiochemical factors into pretty much two groups. There's the hydrophilic group and the lipophilic group. Hydrophilic opioids include morphine and Dilaudid, and this is because their partition coefficient is quite low. What does this mean? This means that they're slower to cross the CSF and they're slower to clear from the CSF. Clinically, this translates to either a delayed onset or a longer duration of um, me medication metabolism. 
the um, thing to note with morphine is that you'll see it has uh, a tendency to spread rostrally, and so you may notice that uh, patients can sometimes have delayed respiratory depression, and that's one of the reasons why we keep them in the hospital for about 24 hours after the trial, just so that we can make sure there are no delayed effects from the medication. On the flip side, lipophilic medications have a very, very high partition coefficient. Um, lipophilic medications include medications like fentanyl or sufentanyl. They have rapid access to CSF. They have greater vascular uptake. What this translates to is quicker onset and shorter duration. So if you look in this schematic here, the fentanyl doesn't travel very far, whereas the morphine travels up and down the entire spinal column. Um, we usually reserve fentanyl for patients where they have very localized pain right at the catheter tip because the medication will essentially stay right there once it's administered. As mentioned before, opioids can cause um, several significant side effects such as nausea, sedation, and even urinary retention that can be sometimes bothersome. It happens very rarely in intrathecal patients, but um, common practice has been to add a local anesthetic as an adjuvant therapy. The most common local anesthetic added is bupivacaine. It's an amide local anesthetic with high lipid solubility. The current recommendations are, used, are to use a concentration of less than 40 milligrams per ml, and to keep the rates at 10 to 15 milligrams per day. Typically, when we add a local anesthetic to an opioid, the local anesthetic essentially replaces the saline part of the solution. So the primary medication will still be the opioid. So when you go and program the patient, we still program via the concentration and the dose that we want for the opioid, and the computer system will um, calculate the proportion for the bupivacaine. Um, the reason we have these recommendations is because we want to try to avoid frequency of refills and then we want to avoid bupivacaine, bupivacaine cardiotoxicity. Um, this is a study where it shows, it's actually in non-cancer patients, but it's quite applicable to cancer patients as well, where it showed that bupivacaine co-administration with opioid has led to a lower rate of drug tolerance and also a lower rate of dose escalation in patients. This is a retrospective study where they looked at 126 patients. These patients were either given opioid or opioid plus bupivacaine to start after they had their pump implanted. So they did a responder analysis and they charted the proportion of patients with either greater than 30% pain relief from baseline or greater than 50% pain relief from baseline. And patients either received uh, um, intrathecal opioid or intrathecal opioid plus bupivacaine. So if we look at the three month mark, you'll see that 38% of um, patients reported greater than 30% pain relief from baseline. Their baseline was a um, pain score of about 7.5. Um, whereas with um, opioid plus bupivacaine, 41% of these patients noted greater than 30% um, pain relief from baseline. And if we move along the timeline to 12 months post-implant, um, with the opioid group, only 31% of patients um, reported greater than 30% pain relief from baseline, um, whereas with the combination group, 51% um, reported greater than 30% pain relief from baseline at the 12-month mark. Um, this is also very similar um, down here um, in the combination group for people that reported greater than 50% pain relief. By the same token here, that what they also um, graphed was, um, or what they also studied was also the rate of dose escalation. They noted that people with the combination of opioid plus bupivacaine had a lower rate of dose escalation over the course of the first 12 months after the implant, whereas patients who just received opioid alone um, had to increase their rate quite significantly and this might be a contri contributor to drug tolerance and opioid-induced hyperalgesia in the long run. 
Another adjuvant I'd like to bring your attention to is um, an alpha-2 agonist, otherwise known as clonidine. A lot of us know clonidine as a blood pressure medication, but um, it actually works via presynaptic and postsynaptic actions by decreasing calcium channel inflow and increasing potassium conductance, leading to hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Um, typically, we don't recommend using clonidine as a single agent, although you'll note in the consensus guidelines that it is actually a third line agent to use by itself. Um, we usually recommend it to be used um, together with a local anesthetic or together with an opioid for synergistic effect, and it's shown to prolong the um, effect of the local anesthetic as well. Um, it's important to note that because um, clonidine is very sensitive to blood pressure, you typically want to run it um, probably less than 500 micrograms per day, just because anything beyond that will lead to quite severe hypertension. Also, when you um, stop the infusion abruptly, it will lead to rebound hypertension, panic attacks, and psychotic behavior that is very um, disturbing to the patient. We talked a little bit about an NMDA antagonist, ketamine. Um, ketamine, again, is used in combination with an opioid plus a local anesthetic. It, we rarely use it in um, cancer pain patients just because it has a very, very narrow therapeutic window. Patients can often get um, difficulty with mental status, mood disorders, and the ability to not think straight, which already complicates um, their cancer pain, and so typically we don't use it in um, cancer pain if we can avoid it. Um, for patients that do have some component of spasticity um, with the cancer, we um, often resort to using adding a little bit of baclofen into the intrathecal pump. Um, baclofen works via the GABA-B receptors. Again, it has presynaptic and postsynaptic um, actions. And uh, side effects of it include drowsiness, sedation, um, flaccidity, and weakness. This is an interesting medication that we don't have at UCLA just yet. I'm trying my very best to get it on formulary. It is a non-opioid analgesic derived from snail toxin. It works on the N-type calcium channel blockers to inhibit nociception. It actually works very well for both neuropathic and nociceptive pain. And the nice thing is that you can use it by itself or you can use it in combination with um, the local anesthetic or opioid. As you'll see in the next few slides, it is actually a first-line agent based on the um, polyanalgesic guidelines. Um, I, unfortunately, it also has a narrow therapeutic window, but um, for f if you titrate it slowly, you'll be able to avoid a lot of these um, side effects that can happen, which is psychosis, cognitive impairment, hallucinations, stupor. Um, the nice thing is that nobody has died with this medication, even with overdose, and if you do turn it down, the um, side effects wear off almost immediately, so it's really nice. Here is a schematic of how it works. It prevents calcium influx, therefore leading to um, inhibition of nociception in the postsynaptic membrane. So here's the polyanalgesic algorithm for intrathecal therapies. Basically what happens is that a group of physicians meet every year, every two years to review um, recommendations for intrathecal drug delivery. Right now, um, the first line agents are still morphine, Dilaudid, and Ziconotide, which is pre -alt, um, the derived from the snail toxin. Fentanyl has moved up to number two just because of its lipophilicity and also its ability to, I'm sorry, it's a rare cause of um, granuloma. It doesn't really cause granuloma formation. Um, these combination medications are becoming very, very popular um, and frequently used on the market just because um, patients, uh, it's very well tolerated in patients and both in terms of side effects as well as pain relief. Clonidine is a third-line agent right now, but like I said before, it is very, very rarely used as a single-line agent. Down here, um, lines five and six, most of these medications are experimental medications, so 
I personally have never used them in a um, intrathecal mix, um, so I would be very, very careful. I think they're safe in animals, and they've, they've been tested somewhat in humans, but it's not FDA approved. So we're very, very happy with intrathecal therapy just because of its dose-sparing effects, but we also have to be very cognizant of some of the complications that it can bring. The complications are very rare, but nevertheless, we have to be, um, we have to be cognizant about them. Complications can relate to equipment, or they can e relate mostly to medications. Um, with regards to equipment complications, they can be catheter-related. Most of the catheter catheter-related problems happen immediately after surgery where um, the catheter has uh, disconnected, it wasn't tight enough, there is a kinking when you're tucking the catheter in, or you know when you're closing, you accidentally nick the catheter. It is also possible to have the catheter inserted too low where it can lead to fecal incontinence or urinary retention. If you suspect a catheter leak, you can use that catheter access port and um, actually figure out exactly where the leak is, and then you can um, take the patient back to surgery for a revision to revise the catheter. In the future, hopefully, there'll be 3D tomography um, to, to detect these leaks without us doing a catheter dye study, and there might be even pressure sensors that we could hook up to the patient to monitor exactly um, where the catheter is. Is it, you know, did it leak out? Is it in the epidural space? Because in the epidural space, there would be no cyclic cycle of the CSF pressure, whereas in the, um, if it's in the intrathecal space, with it, the CSF pressure will vary with cardiac and respirations. Um, this is a special and interesting complication that only relates to intrathecal therapy. Um, an intrathecal catheter granuloma is basically an inflammatory mass at the very tip of the intrathecal catheter. So here's a picture of it in lateral view, and then here is a picture of it here. Um, nobody really knows what causes the mechanism of an intrathecal catheter granuloma. The most common um, mechanism is due to areas of low CSF flow. So it's been hypothesized that the lowest areas of CSF flow are in the lower thoracic and upper lumbar regions. And so they're thinking that because of the low CSF flow, it causes the drug to accumulate. And over a period of one or two years, um, it can lead to this uh, inflammatory mass form formation. Um, other mechanisms of possible intrathecal granuloma formation are either an allergy to the catheter tip, an infection at the catheter tip, or some sort of drug contamination. Um, with all the um, reports and research out there, what's cor directly correlated to intrathecal catheter granuloma formation is actually the high drug concentration, the high drug dose, and also um, rapid escalation of the medication. So right now, at least for morphine, the common recommendations are to try to stay under a dose of morphine uh, 15 milligrams per day or under a concentration of 10 milligrams per ml. Anything beyond these numbers, you risk um, the possibility of granuloma formation. Fentanyl, clonidine, and baclofen don't have this problem, and so that's why sometimes if a patient's pain is localized, uh, physicians do prefer to use fentanyl. Um, there is no set duration of time post-implant um, where a patient is at risk for granuloma formation, but research has shown that the median duration is about two years. How does an intrathecal catheter granuloma present? Usually it's a patient that keeps coming into your office due to escalating pain. You've increased the pump a couple times, um, and uh, the pain either gets worse or is unrelenting. Um, Patients sometimes can get sensory changes because the mass is pushing against the spine. Um, when they have motor changes, that's pretty, pretty, pretty late. The granuloma must be pretty big. So what do we do when we suspect a, um, intrathecal granuloma? We definitely would recommend getting an MRI with and without contrast or a CT myelogram. A CT myelogram is basically just dye injected into the spinal fluid and it'll be able to, the granuloma itself will light up. 
Um, if a patient is asymptomatic and there's just a granuloma seen on MRI, what we would recommend is to pull the catheter back a little bit and see if the granuloma would resolve. If the granuloma does not resolve, then we'd recommend um, taking out all of the drug from the pump and replacing it with saline. Unfortunately, you'll have to convert everything from the intrathecal pain medication to orals, so that's a little bit cumbersome. Usually, granulomas resolve within about two to five months, and the only way we'll be able to tell if a granuloma is resolved is to get repeat imaging. At any time, if a patient presents with sensory deficit or motor changes, um, I would probably forego all of the steps that I just mentioned and just take them to surgery after you get an MRI to revise the catheter because you don't want the spinal cord to be further compressed with time. Finally, these are just some other um, pump-related, medication-related um, side effects that can be encountered. They are very, very rare if you're careful um, with perioperative antibiotics um, as well as your dosing. Um, I typically see my patients back, you know, every one or two weeks after implant, at least for the first month, to adjust their um, pump if necessary. Usually after the first month there, they get to a pretty stable dose and we're able to convert all of their orals to the intrathecal and, you know, most of them are quite happy. In summary, I just wanted to leave you with these take-home points. Intrathecal drug delivery is a valuable option for refractory cancer-related pain, but we have to weigh the risks and benefits as well. Intrathecal infusions allow for targeted drug delivery with reduced opioid-related side effects. Um, the cost effectiveness has been shown to be evident at about three to six months after the implant. Common medications that can be used alone or in combination for intrathecal pain therapy include opioids, local anesthetics, alpha-2 agonists, baclofen, and ziconotide. We must not overlook the catheter-related problems and ca uh, intrathecal catheter granuloma formation as potential complications of intrathecal drug therapy. Thank you very much.